Good afternoon, welcome to CS1 and welcome to UCLA for, for the many of you who are new. Uh, I, my name is Jens Palsberg, I am the Chair of Computer Science and I am also your lead instructor for CS1. CS1 is a, a class that we have to, to get you fired up about computer science, uh, in case you weren't already. We uh, assembled a list of some of the best speakers we have in computer science. Uh, many of them will be your professors in, in classes later on and uh, many of them will be available to do independent study or research projects when you get a little bit further ahead. Um, my job today is to say a little bit about computer science. I will take the chance to give a bit of history uh, of uh, computing and say something about the department. So UCLA, maybe you know, there are 10 UC campuses. UCLA is the smallest in area and the biggest in students. There was a, a few years ago when I checked last, there were more than 25,000 undergraduates. I think there are even a little bit more now, more than 12,000 graduate students and more than 4,000 faculty. And um, already in 2008, UCLA had more applicants for undergraduate studies than any other US university. And the number of applicants has gone up a lot. I will show you some numbers just for computer science later. Um, we have faculty with awards of all kinds, Nobel Prizes, National Medal of Science, members of National Academy of Science, members of National Academy of Engineering, and, and many other uh, high honors. And I think you will be pleased to take classes from these people and get to do projects with these people. There's a lot of excitement here. There's a lot of high quality work and teaching going on. So uh, this class is just about getting into computer science, see the big picture, get excited about some particular areas, and then detailed classes on all those topics will come as you go in computer science. Uh, I would like you to just get a, a broad sense when you're done with this class, maybe uh, there's one or two things you are more excited about when, than you were before, but at least I hope that you will, you will have a broader sense of what's actually going on in computer science today as a field. And you will get to know some of the faculty members from their talks and from chatting with them after their, uh, their lectures. So I will, um, I will give a, a brief overview of the class. Really, um, I'm, I am going to give just this one lecture here today. Otherwise, my main, uh, my main work was to get the right people to give the lectures for you. And, um, and then I'll talk about the department and, and then a bit of history. What we will have is we will have uh, nine lectures. I will give this one. And then uh, you will see pictures of these people a bit later. Uh, Dimitri Tosopoulos will give a lecture about computer graphics and computer vision. Alan Kay will give a lecture about programming languages. Uh, Elias Eskin will give a lecture about uh, computer science as it's applied to biology and medicine. And then Rich Koff will give a lecture about artificial intelligence. Um, Jason Kong will give a lecture about computer architecture. Then we have to pause for Veterans Day. And then after that comes Kerry Nachenberg, who will talk about computer security. And then the last two lecturers are Dian Alkali, will talk about robotic space exploration. And, and finally, Len Kleinrock, about a brief history of the internet. So with all this in mind, uh, let me now say how we are going to run this. Uh, my email address is easy to get, it's also here. You can write to me anytime if you have problems, uh, let me know. And um, otherwise, my job is just to make sure everything runs smoothly from this lecture on. Uh, all reading assignments are on CourseWeb, so I hope, I hope you know CourseWeb by now. It's where you will find uh, all, everything I have just said. You will find uh, all the reading assignments are already there. You will, as, the as the lecturers come by, you will see the slides. Uh, for every lecture. If you're lucky, the slides that I'm showing you now are already on CourseWeb. And then in addition to that, uh, we have uh, our two uh, teaching assistants. Hey, where are you? Over there. These gentlemen, stand up. Um, so this is Kwonghua and Jared. They are your teaching assistants. You're split up into two uh, halves, more or less, and uh, they will uh, give you a quiz every week, and they will give you another lecture uh, related to what whoever the main lecturer was. Every week you will find additional four links on the webpage to uh, contemporary articles from the newspapers and magazines 
about whatever the, the topic is and the, and so they will fill you in with some more stuff than what the lecturer that week already said. So you know the, the, the main lecture is on Mondays like we have now and then the TA sessions are on Wednesdays and Fridays to, uh, just to, to, get, to get a little further into the topics and get these gentlemen's perspective on, on what's going on. Thank you. Um, we will grade. You, we, will, we have to give you a grade at the end. I'm, a, I'm actually one of these people who almost wish that we didn't have to give grades for a class like this, but we have to. And so what we'll do is that we will uh, give the main part of the grade based on the quizzes. And so uh, we will give you one quiz every week, that's nine, and then eight of those will count. And then in the final exam week, we'll give you an essay to write. And uh, so we'll grade you based on that too. And otherwise, we'll do 10% based on, on participation. And so that's, so that's the class. So the class is really not about grading. It's not about how much did you actually learn. This is about getting excited about computer science. So here's uh, our department in one slide. We have 31 full-time faculty. Uh, two of them uh, you are going to meet before too long. David Smallberg is our uh, lecturer for 31. I think many of you will have lectures on Mondays with Smallberg, right? And the other one is Paul Eggert, who teaches many of our software classes. Um, then we have a bunch of joint faculty, adjunct professors, temporary lecturers. We have many joint appointments with the medical school, statistics, electrical engineering, and uh, math, and probably some departments I forgot. So we is like, it's like the usual story nowadays, computing and software and computer science is everywhere, and one of the ways you see that is via the joint appointments with other, other departments. Um, to give you a, a very current number here, for fall 2013, more than 4,000 uh, people applied to be you, essentially, to be freshmen in computer science. Many of you are freshmen. Uh, and we accepted 13%. And so we are now in the situation that if I applied with my credentials from high school, I would not be accepted to UCLA, which I actually never was because I took my education somewhere else. But in any event, uh, this is the most selective, you are the most selective class we've ever had in computer science at UCLA. And we thought we were pretty selective before that. And so there are 111 of you, and uh, we are here to make sure you get the best possible education in computer science. We also have a graduate program, and um, we, we have uh, usually, the numbers here are quite typical, we have usually about 80 master's uh, students who finish every year, and somewhere between 27 and 34 PhDs who finish every year. We have eight areas that here are just listed by name, and I'll show you some pictures of the, of the uh, professors in a bit. Uh, the, the eight areas that we think we are really good in, artificial intelligence, architecture, uh, computational systems biology, graphics and vision, information systems, which I think is the modern word for databases, networks, software systems, and theory. And to start with networking, maybe you know already, UCLA was the first node on the internet. October 29th, 1969, over here in a, in a room over in Boulder Hall on the third floor, uh, they sent uh, the first uh, message on the internet. They sent it to Stanford. So it's usually this thing that we say we sent the first message on the internet, and Stanford says they received the first uh, message on the internet, but it's actually true. And uh, Kleinrock, who was, uh, who was and is one of the key people there in getting the internet going, got the National Medal of Science. Uh, uh, from President Bush five years ago. And then things happened. So maybe you walked around Bolter Hall a little bit already, and uh, we, we got a new uh, door uh, to Bolter Hall not long ago, just a couple of years ago. And here's the St. Klein Rock standing uh, just in the southeast corner of Bolter Hall at the second floor. And you'll see that there's, there's a, some black and, and what should we call this color? Uh, light colors in the floor, and they, they kind of there's, there's a, it's not the same, right? It changes a little bit. See, there's something there. And uh, what happened was that sometime this spring, after this thing had been up for a few years, uh, somebody actually paid attention to the floor pattern. And it turns out that the architect, UCLA's architect, uh, had, uh, had coded a message in the floor. And uh, the message uh, is like this. So this is, the fl this is uh, my schematic of the floor that Kleinrock was standing on, and you can see uh, he was standing around here, if you look carefully. And, uh, and this is ASCII. So you know how uh, computers represent 
numbers and letters in, um, in particular ways, and ASCII is one of the classical, most famous ones. Um, so it's an 8-bit uh, representation of letters and numbers. And it turns out that if you look really carefully and read this as, I think, the, the black here is 0 and these things here are 1, if you read it as a binary code, in ASCII it spells out lo and behold, exclamation mark. And there's a story behind that, because when the first message was sent on the internet from Bolter Hall, uh, they, were, they were actually trying to send login to Stanford. And, and they sent an L, so we start down here, and they sent an O, and then it crashed. And so that, that was the fate of the first message on the internet. And the, and the architect thought that this was such a good beginning for a coded message, so he, he continued low and, and there's some more flaw, behold. And so that, that's the story about how Bolter Hall, in some sense, got its uh, internet history a little bit more enshrined into, into the floor. Okay, so for artificial intelligence, we have four professors. Uh, Adnan Davish, former chair of the department. Michael Dyer, Rich Koff, you will actually get to see, uh, give a lecture. I think I've actually circled him. Yes, I circled him. <laughs> he, so, so he will actually give a lecture here uh, about artificial intelligence. And Judah Pearl, who... <laughs> Uh, won the Turing Award. Maybe you know that the, the world at large has the Nobel Prize and we don't have a Nobel Prize in computer science but we have the Turing Award which is named after Alan Turing who was one of the key people during the Second World War in England to break the uh, Nazi Germany's uh, code that they used to communicate with ships and troops and stuff like that. And um, Judah Pearl got the Turing Award uh, it's a two years ago now, and so we are very proud of him. He uh, got the Turing Award for revolutionizing artificial intelligence. If you are lucky, you will get a chance to meet him. Uh, computer uh, system architecture, we have uh, six uh, faculty members. Jason Kong, former chair of the department, and circled. Uh, Milos Asigovas, uh, another former chair of the department, Pod Cognac, Glenn Reinman. Majid Sarafzadeh, Yuval Tamir. Uh, There's a good chance you can get to take classes from all of these, and Jason Kong will come here and give intro to architecture in a few weeks. Uh, then we have computational systems biology. So here we have uh, Jody Stefano, Elisa Eskin, Stott Parker, and uh, we, have an, we have this fellow who's going to show up and talk about computational biology and bi computational medicine. Uh, he has a joint appointment in the medical school, uh, so he, he is actually joint professor between computer science and human genetics. Uh, Jody Stefano has a joint appointment in the medical school, Stott Parker. He's 100% computer science, but works a lot together with uh, professors in the medical school. And so does some of the other professors, in fact. But um, these, this is the group that forms our computational systems biology group. Then we have graphics and vision. Um, the top two, Tony Chan and Stan Osher, they are... Uh, actually, their primary appointment uh, in both cases are in math. And um, then Song Tun Chu's uh, primary appointment is in statistics. And then we have Stefano Soato and Dimitri Tosopoulos. And here he is also going to come <laughs> and uh, give a lecture. He has a, uh, an Oscar. You know there's a concept of the uh, Academy Award in uh, motion pictures. He has an Oscar for technical achievement. A lot of the stuff that goes into building animated pictures goes back to things he invented uh, years back. Uh, then we have computer networking. Okay, so we are famous for networking at UCLA. You know, the, the uh, school is, has a tagline, the birthplace of the internet. And uh, so here you see Kleinrock again, Mario Jola, Deborah Estrin, who in the meantime is, uh, became the first uh, employee at the Cornell Tech Campus in New York City. And uh, so she is uh, most likely going to go from being a full-time professor to be adjunct professor because of her other engagements. Then we have Song Wu Lu, who is also vice chair of the department now, Mani Srivastava, whose primary appointment is in electrical engineering, and Lisa Chang, who uh, is leading the, uh, the, uh, one of the main efforts right now for the next generation internet. There's a major uh, national initiative that's centered at UCLA, and she is the leader of that with many different sites involved. You will hear more about that at some point, I'm sure. And Kleinrock will come and give a talk. So he will, he will end the quarter. So you can, so this whole story about the internet and the history of the internet, you will get in much more detail and uh, um, 
with many, with many more stories from the old days from Fine Rock as we go on. Then we have software systems. That's what I'm interested in. Uh, I'm interested in compilers, programming languages, embedded systems, anything where, where software is the primary thing. We also have Paul Eggert, as I mentioned earlier, Todd Milstein, myself, David Smallberg, we talked about, and Alan Kay, the second Turing Award winner. And he is the one who will come and talk about um, programming languages. So you know that uh, everybody's used to C++ and maybe Java and JavaScript and uh, other such languages nowadays, they're all object-oriented. And um, Alan Kay was the one who coined the term object-oriented programming back in uh, the early, just around 1970. And uh, so even though some of the ideas were even older, he was the one who really promoted and pushed much further the whole concept of ob object-oriented programming in the United States and, and eventually the whole world and got the Turing Award for uh, all of that. And so we have um, one Turing Award winner on the list of lecturers. And then of course, there's me who's giving the lecture right now. Uh, we should not forget about big data, of course. And uh, here we have the four members of the new big data center at UCLA. So you know how the world is going. There's so much data and so little time. And these people here are John Cho, Tyson Condi, Wei Wang, Carlos Agnolo. Um, all of them interested in data, data mining, machine learning, and pretty much getting the big data under control so we can use it for, for good purposes. Uh, sadly, none of them are going to come and give a talk this quarter. We only had nine slots, and so we had to make a choice. Uh, but uh, for, those, who are for those, of the, those of you who are interested in this kind of thing, uh, the center is up and running. It's housed over close to Bolter Hall. And uh, you, will, you will get a chance to talk to these people if you like. And then finally, uh, computer science theory. The reason we, uh, they are last is not because we think they are the worst. It's simply because T is the last of all the letters. So we, we, uh, we use the key word, and then we sort of alphabet, alphabet, have them in alphabetical order based on that. And uh, there you go, theory. Some, some, somebody has to come last, right? So we have Eli Gaffney, Alexander Shevstov, Rafi Ostrovsky, Amit Sahai, Jennifer Vaughan. Uh, let me just mention a few things now that they are on the screen here. Rafi Ostrovsky and Amit Sahai are two of the foremost uh, researchers in the world in crypto, cryptography. And uh, they have a center on uh, what they call the Center for Information and Computation Security, which really is, uh, I think, foremost a, a crypto research center. And then we have Jennifer Vaughan, who is uh, a machine learning professor. We could as well have listed her under artificial intelligence. And uh, so along with some of the, what, what some people would call the data mining professors that I covered a minute ago, we would call her one of the machine learning professors. In the end, they're all uh, trying to understand big data, understand the patterns in big data and how to apply the knowledge we get that way. Okay, so uh, that was as much as I wanted to say about the department. Now I want to sneak in a little bit of uh, lecture about uh, the um, history of computing. We put a, a link on the web page to history. That's actually a wonderful, very illustrated uh, history of computing that, that you can see. And uh, it's actually more pictures than it's text. It's quite nice. I read it again today just to, to get fired up for this lecture here. And I enjoy it every time I read it. And, and so you know what it is. Computers, in the old days, a computer was actually a person. Somebody who was sitting and computing, usually computing tables of ta big tables, not just big tables, but books and books of tables of, well, principally, um, tables for artillery. So, you know, you, if you are going to uh, shoot like up in the air and then over something and down on the other side, or maybe if it's a ship, same idea, uh, to have any sense of whether you're going to hit, uh, you have to have this, this trajectory under control. And uh, that's where computers came in, which were uh, usually they were people and they would make books. And then the people then firing off the artillery, they would, um, they would consult the books and get a sense of what, how they should position uh, the gun to hit. And then there was another big application in the old days of computers, which is census. Uh, there was this story about how around 19, what, ah, okay, let's say 1890, um, Census could be done in, in a matter of months, okay, more than a few months, maybe seven, eight, nine months. 
And then the population of the United States grew and grew and grew. And uh, eventually it took years. And that we're still back in this roughly 1900. And so people realized something had to be done. And that became one of the inspirations for making more automatic computers. Not fully automatic, not electronic, but just more automatic uh, than what they had before. And uh, one of the people there who was uh, heavily involved uh, went on to uh, make uh, IBM, as it eventually became called, International Business Machines. And uh, that was well before electronic computers started. So if we're going to talk about electronic uh, computers, then we have to go all the way up to the 1940s. And so there were some efforts there where uh, at Harvard there was the Mark I computer that was not fully automatic or fully electronic certainly, uh, but it could do some uh, computing. Of course, it had very little memory and very slow and all those things. Then there was the uh, um, effort at Iowa State where they built also a computer that was mostly automatic. They used a lot of tubes and stuff in those days and nobody was sort of really interested. That computer just got completely abandoned. And then of course there was the Colossus computer in England that was uh, the helper of, now we mentioned Alan Turing, to break the code of, of the Germans. And so all those computers are not, uh, are sort of like and a hybrid between a person and the modern electronic digital computer. And so they were, they were fairly automatic, but there's still a lot of human effort that goes into computing. And then, um, well, so here I have a slide about the, uh, the computer. It was actually called the ABC computer. Um, at least that's what I, I have seen people call it. It goes back to C for computer and A and B for the for the two uh, key people who led the effort. And um, well, you can, one thing you can see about this slide is that these things were very heavy. This was in the days when the weight of computers was measured in tons. And then there was the, uh, the Mark I computer at Harvard. Um, just to mention, Howard Eichen, uh, who, who was the lead designer, uh, gave name to the computer science building for that for many, many years was the computer science building at Harvard. I've been to the Aiken building, but then it was torn down and then the new building was uh, named after, uh, well, names that were selected by Bill Gates and, and his uh, collaborator at Microsoft. Uh, again, very big, very heavy computers. And then the Colossus computer from, uh, from Britain. And again, uh, very big, very heavy. And another characteristic, very few. In those days, there, you know, there was the, there were, this was a few years later, but there was this estimate that was done of how many computers are we going to need in this world. And the estimate, the official estimate was about six. That's all we need. So nowadays, probably each of us has at least six computers if you start counting, right? So it's, uh, it's, it's one of those things, but I think it's quite interesting that if you look at, at a graph of the last, say, 70, 80 years, one thing you can do is that you can, you can plot time on the x-axis and then you can count number of computers per person in the world on the y-axis. And what you will see is that there are certainly more and more computers per person in the world. The number of people is going up, but the number of computers is going up much more. And there was a point not long ago where we hit one, where there's the number of computers is equal to the number of people. You know there's about seven billion people. Uh, but now that was not long ago, but now there's way more computers than there are people in the world. And so I don't know how, what the factor is now, but it's uh, already considerable. And if we just take the, the people in this room, I, it's certainly well above one. Then we get to the real breakthrough, ENIAC. So now we are a little bit later and we are at UPenn, University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia. And that was the first project where they really built a, a fully automatic computer. Very, very big. They it took them two years to, to get it to work and um, just took up a lot of space, but it actually worked. And so ENIAC was the parent of all modern computing, one can say. Uh, but there was, some, there was some trouble in the beginning. Uh, the inventors and, uh, and Penn sort of got into some fight over exactly who was responsible and owned what. And eventually they started their own company and they sold this computer called Univac which uh, as the history uh, that's on the, on the link that I, I gave you, 
as it explains very nicely, Univac used to be the word for computer. Just like we don't talk about tissue, we talk about Kleenex. We don't talk about a copier, we talk about a Xerox machine, right? In those days, a computer was a Univac. That was the word. That's a long time ago. That was, that was sort of like in the 50s. Um, but they were, they, they were very, very successful and really what started it all. Um, the, uh, the ENIAC uh, had in many ways um, a modern design except one thing. There's one thing that became, that became the big invention a bit later, which is the stored program. In those days, a program was sort of like an external thing. Nowadays, we're so used to that the computing devices that we use, everything is there, the data and the software and everything is, is on the computer. But in those days, there was no memory for storing the software itself. You had to, you had to somehow get that to the computer in other ways, which is a whole story in itself. And um, then uh, came von Neumann, one of the uh, really uh, greatest figures of the computing history. Um, he was part of ENIAC, he knew all about it, and uh, he brought computing uh, a lot forward. In fact, when we talk about the computers that you and I have, a few of each of us, what is, what is the core design of that computer? It's actually called the von Neumann architecture. And uh, so what is the von Neumann architecture? It's sort of this idea of having some memory, having the processing units, maybe having some special uh, hardware for doing arithmetic, and, and then uh, some, some kind of connection that, like a bus that connects all of those together, or as they are nowadays, on one chip, something that connects them together on the chip. So that idea of splitting up and setting up things that way, that is the von Neumann architecture. And um, as part of that whole development came the stored program computer, and then we pretty much at that point have computing as it is today. Okay, so these things were big, and so then the next the sort of the, it's more or less a parallel movement, but uh, the next big thing in making computers smaller so that they eventually can approach the size we have today, like a, like a phone, uh, which for me is just a computer I can make phone calls from, uh, is the transistor. So even in the beginning, of course, transistors were still fairly big, but, but the idea of the transistor, that was the breakthrough. The idea of having an, an electronic switch, a switch that can be uh, switched on and off based on current. And um, really the, the history from 1947 and until today and maybe into the future still is the story about how transistors have gotten smaller and smaller and smaller and enabled us to have computers and, and their memory be smaller and smaller along with it. And as things got smaller, we got uh, integrated circuits. And so, um, so the idea for a long time was uh, also when I was uh, a child was that you would have a maybe the CPU on one integrated circuit on one chip as we would say today and then you would have the memory on another chip and then you would have uh, maybe uh, the arithmetic unit on another chip and, and then all of this would be on one board and so that way everything is integrated on one board. So that was the state of computing back when I was a child, 60s say. And then came uh, the, uh, the next big step forward, the microprocessors. So now we are up to the point where the movement is towards not just putting all of the computer on one board, but to put, it on one, to put all of it on one chip. And, um, and so you, if we follow this, this whole development up to today, uh, in those days, uh, people were happy if they could get all of the pieces of one computer on one chip. And then if we look at the computers we have today, then first they would put uh, multiple processors, processing units, would put maybe it would be multiple chips into one computer. Then now what we have today is multi-core computers where there would be multiple processing units on one chip. And then if you have a phone, then along with the phone there'll be a graphics processing unit and, and other things. And now the next big move that's happening this decade is that the CPU, multiple CPUs, and the graphics processing unit, the GPU, and maybe other things will all be on the same chip. Maybe along with the software radio, all of this just goes onto one chip. And that's of course uh, a sign again that everything has gotten very small and then very useful. 
I often think about when I drive up to UCLA, pa the parking lot nine, where I park in the morning, I show uh, this card. I have to wave a card, right, to get into the parking lot. And so again, it's just chips talking about each other. And these <coughs> things are so small that there's just a little bit uh, in there. I was reminded again yesterday, I went to Office Depot to buy toner for my printer. And, uh, and to remember what toner I was buying, I had cut out a bit of, the, of this cardboard box that, that the toner came in. I mean, the toner was long thrown away, but I had still like the front page. And when I walked into Office Depot, all the, uh, these alarms, theft alarms, went off because they thought that they don't distinguish between going in and out apparently, but they thought that I had stolen toner. And all I was bringing was the box. So clearly there was a computer in there that was then setting off the, the theft alarm. Um, so you all, you all know about, uh, about how things have gotten smaller. We normally call this Moore's Law. Moore's Law eventually, uh, well, in the beginning it was talking about that the number of transistors w that we can pack into a particular area, uh, say one square millimeter or one square centimeter or something like that, uh, is that um, number of transistors is going to double every, I think it was nine months when I was very young. And then it became 18 months, and I think that's more or less what they're still uh, looking at today. So every, every two years, say, uh, now, uh, computers in some sense uh, getting to be half the size. We can pack in twice as many transistors. And uh, for a long, long time, uh, this was very good news because when the computers, uh, as they were getting smaller and smaller, uh, it also meant they were getting faster. For, for some reason uh, that you can get details of when you take classes in computer science and electrical engineering, it was the case that the clock frequency with which one could process stuff on these smaller and smaller computers was also going up, which is what led to what I call the, the holiday model of uh, computer programming, which is you imagine you have a boss, your boss tells you, uh, well, we have this software over here. Could, it, could you please get it to go twice as fast? And so the way you do that, up to about 10 years ago was that you would immediately go on six months holiday and then when you come back there would be a computer that would be twice as fast and then you buy that one and then you're done. Uh, this graph here is showing very well how the number of transistors is going up. You can see there's a log scale here. The problem is that this model doesn't work, uh, this holiday model doesn't work so well anymore because the clock frequency is not really going up. I remember when I bought some computers about uh, ten years ago, the clock frequency in those computers was ah, it's about a gigahertz, and now it's maybe three gigahertz what we can buy today. So it's certainly not this, the clock speed has certainly not doubled uh, every two years. The, the computers we buy now are much smaller, so Moore's law is still working. Moore's law is actually doing very well. I have talked to architects at Intel who say that they already have Moore's law covered well into the 2020s, but the speed that's a different matter. And so what? What um, the hardware manufacturers do nowadays is that they pack more and more cores onto the computers. And so instead of getting one faster and faster processor, we're getting computers with more and more processors, including this computer. I think it's pretty old now. It has four processors. And of course, it can, use multi it can run multiple threads on each processor, but still. Some of the, I'm guessing, the phones or computers you have may have even more cores. And the problem is that it is much harder to program multiple cores than it is to program one core. And so one of the things we are proud of at UCLA is that in many of the courses you are going to get, you will get a very solid foundation for uh, parallel programming, multi-core programming, concurrent programming, all those things that involves multiple processors, client-server programming for that matter. Uh, you're going to get some already the first year in CS33 then uh, you're certainly going to get something in the graphics course if you choose to take that. We have a programming languages course where there's some parallel programming in there. Uh, we have a later course dedicated to uh, parallel programming. Um, that course focuses on something called OpenMP. And then, um, of course, the operating systems course, not to forget, where there's a heavy dose of uh, building uh, parts of operating systems and there's a lot of uh, multi just multi-threaded programming, if you like, uh, in there. And so um, you, I think you will be well served. I have gone to some of these workshops nowadays that where professors uh, across the country and across the world meet to, to sort of work on this problem of how do we teach the undergraduate students 
parallel programming and concurrent programming and multi-core programming. And what I found out after going to three or four of those is that UCLA is doing very well. We already have what many of the other universities want to offer you. And um, so um, that will work out for you. And then um, let me just say something about how <laughs> this size changed has, has really become um, to, to the point where it's no longer a matter of how, how big is your computer. Nowadays, it's like um, we may not even have desktops anymore. In fact, at home, I got rid of my desktop a long time ago. We don't have desktop computers anymore. In my office, uh, I, have, I kind of have two offices at the moment because I also I have my normal office and I have my chair's office. In the chair's office, there's a desktop computer. In my own office, there's, there's actually no computer because nowadays everything is laptops, right? Not to mention everything is, is phone, right? So we, we just use our phones and then uh, we can do a lot of, of, of the computing that we need to do there. And so the world is changing uh, because of this. Now, we used to say 10 years ago, we could say with a straight face that software was everywhere. But I think the truth is that the, the, the computer revolution is just beginning because computers have gotten so small that not just software is everywhere, but the computers are truly everywhere. And, and uh, this thing that there are many more computers than there are people, that will make profound changes to how the whole society works and what we can do. And uh, you will be in the middle of this. I think, when, I, I remember when I... Uh, when I started learning computing in 1980, I was a freshman in high school, and uh, we just got some of the first mini computers to the high school uh, that were made in, in Northern Europe. And uh, so we were lucky there, we didn't have to deal with mainframes and stuff. And I was very excited and I felt that, hey, I am right there at the entry point of computing, when computing goes from being the area of specialists to something that, that a high school student can learn. And I can just I'm just at the right time at the right place. And, uh, and I thought this for many, many years, but I must tell you, now I think that you are the ones who are at the right time and at the right place, because now this is where computing has gone out of its infancy, which is, I think it has been in the last 30 years, and to really come into where computing will be the main thing in society, where software will really drive everything that we do. And you will be there to be a key in making all this work, making life better for everybody. And um, just as sort of some evidence that people out there know this, um, I looked up um, an article that um, eventually came from, it came from the Wharton School, again, UPenn uh, School of Business, that had uh, done the top 30 innovations in the last 30 years. They did it a couple of years ago. And uh, so you can start with Number one, internet, okay, that started at UCLA. Uh, World Wide Web, PC, laptops, computers, mobile phones, email, see, the top four, that's us, right? And then if you go down the top 30, you will find some, some other things that are clearly uh, have, have software in it, big time. There's the whole thing with DNA testing and, and human genome. So I mentioned Eliezer Eskin, who uh, is deeply into that, uses software big time. Uh, microprocessors, office software, open source software, and we're not even, uh, we're not even uh, done with uh, more than 15 of them. And so we, got, we get into other things here, uh, file compression, social networking, graphical user interfaces, and a few others. And, and many of those that, that are listed that are, are not really what we think of as software things or computer things, there's still software inside. And um, there was one thing that struck me, I was down at at uh, Boeing to visit the alumni in El Segundo uh, two weeks ago. And what struck me is that even Boeing that's making airplanes and uh, things, uh, even they talk more and more about software. It's, it was almost like talking to a software company when, when talking to, to Boeing now. There's so much of what used to be either hardware or not automated at all, it's software nowadays. And they need software people like, uh, like never before. Many other companies that I talk to are like that. They, they, they think software first and, and uh, hope that they can get their stuff done with software nowadays. What you will see as you go through computing is that you will see a very uh, wide span of things. We've talked about applications. What you will see is also 
fundamental techniques that are almost sisters of math. Um, there's the whole question about computability, what can be computed by a computer after all. There's the stuff about computational complexity, which is how long time is it going to take. And especially in the world of big data, uh, as the input sizes grow, how long is it really going to take? What is like the curve? When we look at more and more data, how long is it really going to take? That's the field of computational complexity. And a thing that I think is essential in computing and maybe many other discipline, uh, disciplines is abstraction, which is just to learn to manage the complexity of what we have in front of us. I remember in the old days, I was impressed when I found out that the Boeing 777, which came out some years ago now, had two million lines of software. Uh, I remember when I, I used to be a professor at Purdue, we got access to Windows, for, uh, Windows NT 4.0. 25, millions, 25 million lines of software. Later, we got Windows NT 5.0. That was 60 million lines of software. Um, those numbers are um, very large, very large even for a team of programmers to manage. And the good news is that by building layers of abstraction, we don't have to write 60 million lines of code to get something done because there's so much software that has written before us that we can build on and the key to make that work is abstraction. Another way of saying it is libraries, software libraries are better than they ever were before. You can take something like Instagram that became a hit last year. How could they get so much done in a few months and sell the whole company for uh, many hundreds of millions of dollars? Well the reason is software libraries. There's so much software that's already done that nowadays one can uh, get an idea and get a lot done in say three months. If you, if you look around UCLA, there are six accelerators within a stone throw of UCLA. One of them is here at UCLA with the startup UCLA. There's uh, other uh, accelerators like Start Engine down on Wilshire and other ones a, a little bit further away that help people like you who want to start a company get going. Typically they give you funding, legal help, accounting help, access to investors, um, all that stuff uh, for maybe three months uh, in the beginning. And then if your idea looks viable, then either they send you to, a, to another organization or uh, they will just help you get uh, investment funding so that you can be on your own. And how is it possible to start a company and get going in say three months? And the reason is libraries. There's so much one can get done because a lot of other stuff and more basic stuff has already been done. I, it's a very good sort of tagline for this. I heard one of, the, of the, um, the leading investors in IT companies in Los Angeles. He told me that where 20 years ago, you might need an investment of $5 million to start a software company. Now $50,000 can do it. And so uh, you have the opportunity. You are placed here in Los Angeles, an area not only of immense wealth, but also a lot of, of investors who want to invest in, in you. And, uh, and the company uh, ideas that you have. And uh, that's something where UCLA can help mediate the contacts. We are well connected to the investment community and to the entrepreneurship community. And, of, and we certainly have Startup UCLA to, as, as one of the routes. And um, I, I imagine some of you will end up starting companies either while you're already a student here or maybe afterwards, or maybe you will join a, join a startup company. Um, we are going to have an essay at the end of the class where you're going to predict the f future of computing 10 years from now. And uh, so you can imagine if you had written this essay in 1965 and you had predicted Microsoft 10 years later, that would have been a good essay. Or if you, <laughs> or if you had uh, in 1988, you had predicted Google that started in 1998, that would have been a good essay. Or if you had 10 years ago predicted Instagram, that would have been a wonderful essay, right? So, that, so we are hoping that, that you can be inspired and really think about the future of computing. And whether you go to a startup company or you go to Google or you go to Boeing, um, there's a place for you and uh, there's a place to succeed and really make things, make the world better and make quality of life better. Um, there's another reason for computer science. Um, New York Times had an article two summers ago, where they said that for every graduate in computer science in the United States at any level, bachelor degree, master's degree, PhD, there are free open positions in the United States. And so even though there, have, there was some talk years ago that jobs are leaving the United States, they're moving to foreign countries and stuff, the truth is 
that there are jobs like never before. And um, this is a, a listing from Wall Street Journal just a few years ago about the best paying uh, jobs, uh, entry level. And you can see uh, c computer science ranks up there, number two and number three. And in fact, if you go to the career center of UCLA and look at starting salaries for UCLA graduates across the whole university, computer science is both number one and number two because we have two, two degrees, right? Computer science and computer science and engineering. And they are number one and two for starting salaries across all of UCLA. That's another reason. It's a good, it's a secure job because there's work like never before in the United States in computer science and it's a well-paying job. Um, I used to say that my job as a professor is that your starting salary should be higher than my current salary. <laughs> so now, it, it used to be true, in fact. Now, the world, I have gotten older and uh, and the university pays me a little more money, so now it's a little bit more difficult to make it work. But I can tell you for years and years, it's, until recently, what I said is true. And so that is my goal. I want you to be successful, to be excited about computer science, make the world better, and earn some money along the way. So uh, thank you very much. Enjoy your time at UCLA, and uh, see you soon.